pandemic has been that we've been able to bring together friends and colleagues and partners from all over the world. And um, one of the greatest blessings I think of our lives and Sunita and I was saying this yesterday, is friends who agree to wake up at ungodly hours to come do presentations because we ask. And so I'm grateful to all of you for being here. Now, what is the point of this panel apart from checking off a programming box for Prajnas? Uh, for the past couple of years, uh, some of us at Prajna have been part of a larger British Academy funded project on the experiences of domestic violence survivors in India as they seek help and access to justice. And we've done research in Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu and West Bengal over the last year on this, speaking to survivors and also speaking to service providers. So over the course of the Prajnaya campaign, in parallel to events that are happening in Maharashtra and West Bengal, we've been organizing programs where we can take bits and pieces of our findings and present them and share them prior to the publication of our actual reports. So these are preliminary findings and observations that we are putting out in various uh, configurations. And today's discussion is on the access to justice portion of this project. And um, we have here a panel that I can't quite believe is here. We have Sabah from Pakistan, and I, there will be intros in the chat, so I won't do them. Sabah from Pakistan, Sarah from Bangladesh, and Misa from Sri Lanka, and Shazia and Philippa uh, from India, because we've now adopted them. After <laughs> having made them listen to all our sob stories and tragic stories for two or three years, so certainly belong to us. So um, we've got them, and our facilitator today is Sunita Dhar, whose very presence always gives me the confidence that a program is going to go brilliantly because she's, you know, she's so good with people, with words, with ideas, and you think, you know, here's this nice person, and suddenly comes, this comes a sharp analysis, and this ability to take all the things you've said in a rambling way and put them into perfect cogent order. So Sunita, I'm so happy to have you. I cannot find enough words to express that. And with that, I will dump this panel in your lap and have fun watching it. Thank you, Swarna. Such warm and moving words and welcome to everybody. Really look forward to a brilliant interactive session, especially that it comes from your experience and uh, specifically that we are focusing on uh, access to justice in the context of domestic violence for survivors. And I think this is an extremely important area of work which gets to be neglected many a time. And I think what this panel will do is that we will learn what kinds of strategies that you have been um, you deploying in each of your countries or across the countries in accessing justice and rights and what commonalities do we have? What can we learn from each other? And I do have friends that have joined the session today that have also set up uh, a network, a brilliant network on the gender responsive shelters for survivors of violence. And I hope they will come there's been a study, there's been a toolkit, there's been a lot of work that has gone uh, in the last few years, and I hope they will also add to the knowledge building. I just want to say a few words as we start uh, this conversation today. And I'm really going back because it almost seems like that the COVID pandemic really underscored the structural nature of gender inequalities within and across our countries. And it also essentially brought to light the invisible unrecognized pandemic of uh, gender-based violence, domestic violence, and intimate partner violence. I hate the word shadow pandemic. I think that we're definite, domestic violence is not a shadow pandemic. That it was given visibility during this time by the UN and other um, agencies speaks of how little attention this issue has got over time. And uh, we don't know that millions of women and girls across their diversities from historically excluded communities, whether on sites of conflict uh, in, or in a humanitarian crisis, 
or living in very difficult circumstances were facing multiple and intersecting forms of gender-based violence, femicide. And we know that this violence took place not only in private spaces, but also in the public spaces. We've seen the violence faced by uh, healthcare workers, frontline workers in this period of time and beyond. And we are very concerned about what uh, such a violence does to those that, uh, you know, uh, are, are who they are because of their intersectional identities, their social locations, and the subordinated positions in society. Now, in India, we saw a lot of violence, structural violence and discrimination faced by trans, queer persons, migrant women, women with disabilities, informal sector workers, domestic workers, sex workers, and the like. And we know that these structures of power that really were operating in society did not allow them access to their wealth, uh, their well-being and health and violence services. I also get very concerned that we know the data in year of, uh, I mean, Years after, year after year, we have the data coming up in each of our countries, global data. One in three women experience uh, violence across their lifetime, especially intimate partner violence and sexual violence. And uh, particularly that it starts early in life and uh, in the age group 15 to 34 years. And we know that violence is preventable and that lives of millions of women and girls can be saved. And yet we do so little. I read a few lines uh, written by um, a poetess, a late poetess, Sara Shagufta, I think from Pakistan, as she faced a life of struggle and abuse. And in her poem, Women and Salt, she wrote, from house to footpath, nothing belongs to us. Honor is the spear they brand us with. Our tongues are tied with honor. If the salt of our bodies is tasted one night, we are considered for a whole life as tasteless bread. And then we ask these questions. Why do women not speak up? Why do they not leave abusive relationships? We've had a horrific murder in recent times in India. And people talk about it as if it was so easy for this young woman to have walked out of her very abusive relationship, considering that it was an interfaith relationship and she had no support systems whatsoever. I do also want to focus at this time that uh, in the last two years, I have been a member of the leadership group of the UN Generational Equality Forum, the Action Coalition on uh, Gender-Based Violence as part of a global coalition on safer and inclusive cities. We are eight groups, uh, um, eight organizations that have come together and we are co-represented on this leadership group which includes Jaguri and Safe Trippin from India. And we have uh, groups from Asia, South Africa, and uh, Guatemala, and Latin American groups as well. And we have contributed to the development of the vision and global points of the Action Coalition. And I do want to focus on it because I think it lays the context to some of the work that we do at the policy level. And uh, we, uh, affirmed our commitment to scaling up comprehensive, uh, accessible and quality service for, services for survivors of GBV against women and girls and all their diversity. And that as we work towards enhancing these services, we're committed to bridging the implementation gap, the resource gap uh, that exists and also ensuring that we have evidence-based policy backing up the work in each of the countries. And the idea is that we hope that down the line, at least a hundred countries will have, uh, you know, invested uh, into um, building up their uh, gender responsive law enforcement um, processes so that they can address GBB significantly. And that we need far more resources for women's organizations and activists and human rights defenders. At the same time, we also know that there's a lot that needs to be done uh, in terms of uh, the urgent repair of the criminal justice systems, the rights of survivors to health, shelter, livelihoods, safety, security, restorative justice, reparation, etc. And we do know, at least in the context of our country, that there needs to be a special focus on certainty and swiftness of convictions, because we have to stem the high tolerance for the impunity that exists 
And we're also aware that uh, um, witnesses and women's organizations that accompany uh, victim survivors for uh, legal aid, for protections, also face criminal intimidation by families, by the state for speaking out, for being there. And therefore there's a lot that we need to do. And uh, from here, I'd really like to go over to you to hear each one of you and what you have done and what we can learn from each other. Uh, in the context of this webinar. I'd like to now hand over the mic to Shazia Chaudhary from Oxford University and Philippa Williams from the Queen Mary University of London, who are honorary Indians and are gonna speak about the research they're doing with the Prajanya Trust. And you have 20 minutes, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I'm just gonna share my screen, hopefully. Oh, that's not the right one. <laughs> Can you see that? Yeah. 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 Okay. I think that's the right one. Okay. Right. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for um, inviting us to attend. And it's really, really lovely to meet everybody. And um, I'm personally really excited to hear from everybody else here after, after we've finished uh, presenting. Um, sounds fascinating. So um, I think Philip is going to start and um, give an introduction and then I'll, I'll put in my bit. Philip, when you're ready. Great, thanks ever so much, Shazia, and thanks so much uh, for the introductions. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here on, on um, such a good panel and to yeah to try and understand more about how what uh, we're researching in India fits within the larger kind of region and um, what the kind of overlaps and you know, intersections are in experiences. So um, as one is introduced, we're presenting um, today from a research project called Surviving Violence, Everyday Resilience and Gender Justice in Rural Urban India. Um, just a, a quick context, the project is funded by the British Academy, it involves a number of institutions across both India and the UK, um, <laughs> all up here on the slides, I won't read them out. Um, but more importantly, behind these institutions is a team of fantastic researchers and collaborators, including photographers as well, working across three states, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra and West Bengal. Um, and it's so some of their, their photos that you'll see in the presentation as well. So really it's on behalf of the entire team that we're presenting today, um, some of which might be in the room, of course Swana is, um, and who may wish to also join in the discussion later um, uh, when, um, after the presentations. So about the project in just a little bit more detail. Um, the project came out of discussions with Swana and with some other partners um, just on the slide just now. And this, these discussions really coalesced around the need for better understanding of apparent gap that exists between DV laws on paper, notably the Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act, um, which came to force in 2005, 2006. And then what is actually happening in practice almost 17 years later with regards to this law? So the questions that we're really concerned with was how has PWDVA landed? How do survivors engage with and experience the law? And to what extent are its services and provisions transformative in their everyday lives? So the project isn't uh, directly about the nature and prevalence of, of domestic violence, though of course this is important context. Instead, it focuses more on what um, Catherine Brickell, who works on, on domestic violence in Cambodia, calls survival work. So that is um, survivors of the work that survivors of domestic violence have to do to cope, to struggle, to build resilience, to find hope, deal with disappointment and anger, find support and allies and friends and family, care for their children, their families, often care for their perpetrators, as well as engage with local organizations and services, the police and legal provisions to seek formal and informal support and justice. And all of this obviously at different times and spaces and overlapping and intersecting ways. There's no kind of linear journey that goes on. So given the focus of today's panel, in this presentation, we want to focus on how women engage with ideas and practices and institutions of justice and the law through that survival work. Um, and I should say that we are you know, very much at the kind of the beginning of looking through some absolutely fantastic um, transcripts of interviews. And so what we reflect on today is very kind of much the tip of the iceberg and the start of that analysis. As for, as for methods, sorry, I haven't seen Sorry, that. sorry. <laughs> Okay, so right. say um, next slide. Sorry. Let's say something about methods. I mean, we've yeah. got oh, yeah, to talk more, but um, the project is it's mainly qualitative research um, with semi structured interviews, interviews principally with survivors of domestic violence um, and a cross, cross section of backgrounds from socioeconomic backgrounds, educational, um, religion, caste, gender, sexual minorities, religious minorities, and migrants. 
um, as well as differently abled people. So in total, there's 180 interviews with survivors, and as well as that, um, the team also interviewed um, community members and also key stakeholders, so lawyers, medical practitioners, NGO workers, police and protection officers. Um, okay, so next slide. <laughs> and we also, yeah, I've said about photography. So I appreciate this. Um, many of you will be familiar with the legal landscape in India, but given the regional focus, perhaps a bit of background is, is important. Um, so PWDVA is widely recognised in many circles as a progressive piece of legislation. And although domestic violence was recognised as a crime in 1983 under 4998A, there were significant limitations to the criminal law. And so PWDVA was the outcome of a long campaign by women's groups and lawyers' collectives for more sensitive legislation that also incorporated, incorporated civil remedies. So this legal reform is really important on, on many levels, um, just to sort of highlight what those are. Um, certainly shifted domestic violence from being a kind of uh, pub, private matter into public concerns. Um, it expanded the understanding of domestic relationships, meaning a relationship between two people who live or have at any point of time live together in a shared household. Um, it encompassed a broader definition of violence, um, so not just about uh, physical violence, but also emotional, uh, psychological, financial um, and sexual violence as well. PWDVA encompasses a mix of civil and criminal laws. So you have a kind of range of remedies for women experiencing DV, um, including civil protection, maintenance and residence orders um, in order to kind of create spaces of security and safeguard and um, safety for women to confront and deal with unequal and abusive relationships. Um, and th I mean, the thing is then if, if protection orders issued through PWDVA are um, uh, broken, um, then the criminal it becomes a criminal offence and grounds for criminal prosecution. So this is sort of quasi civil, quasi criminal um, aspect to it. Um, the, the, law, the act also recognises the complexity of victim survivor situations and imagines the necessary involvement of multiple agencies across multiple scales, so service providers, self help groups, and agencies to assist survivors with their medical, or residential, or legal support. And then finally. Um, the Act also recognises or seeks to operationalise a joined up approach to support and service pro provision through protection officers. So this is a kind of significant part of the reform. And the aim for them was to be the first point of contact for survivors and act as mediators and signposts between these different services in a kind of joined up approach. Next slide. <laughs> um, so, of course, the um, PWDVA has come under a lot of scrutiny and certainly the work we're doing builds on um, you know, so much research has gone before by the Lawyers Collective, Palamia Pol Valchandri, and, and many, many others. Um, but just to highlight some of the critiques um, of PWDVA, um, there has you know, been very kind of uneven implementation in, in the Act. Uh, for starters, the, the budgets are managed um, centrally, so funds um, are not provided exclusively for the Act, and so different states will follow different paths for implementation. Um, with very patchy delivery. So we have a situation where, certainly in the three states um, where we've been working, um, in West Bengal, uh, there's just 20 protection officers, in Tamil Nadu, there's 33, and in Maharashtra, there's over 3,000. Um, and that's based on the data that Lawyers Collective um, were collected in 2013, it was available. So as a result, then, the role envisaged for protection officers has you know, not been realised. They're often overburdened, underskilled, and lack sufficient infrastructure and funds to realise the full remit of the work um, imagined, and particularly around the kind of fast track turnaround um, for that work. There are also blind spots in the Act around the rights of sexual minorities and disabled people. Um, and also, you know, this, the fact here is that the state is not really accountable um, in its delivery of the Act. There's no universal data collected on PWDVA civil cases, although the criminal cases do appear in the NCRB NRCB data. Um, and the state is also really not kind of responsible in the way this Act is delivered. There is, there is obviously a language of rights, which is encourage, encourages self-reliance around individuals and around service providers. But as was you know, alluded to in the introduction, there really is a lack of, of welfare and care by the state, a lack of safe houses and shelter homes um, in, in the way the Act is um, implemented. So this you know, really leads to people like Sumi Madoc and Co, um, reflecting on the fact that the Act really reproduces family structures, uh, patriarchal power, 
that re privileges existing gender relations and the household as, as normative. So as we'll see in um, the sort of survival work around accessing justice, um, survivors are really kind of constrained within institutions of, of patriarchy and, and heteronormativity of, of marriage and, and the family. So if we look at the NSH, um, NSHS 5 data, that's 2019 to 21, and obviously to some extent impacted by the experiences of the pandemic, but it, you know, there is quite a lot of continuity with what's gone before. We can see here that you know, only 14% of women ever seek help or support. Um, you know, that's so very small, you know, very small minority even think to kind of seek support, seek to access justice in the first place. And of those that do turn for help, but the majority look to their family, uh, their, their husband's family as well, and friends too. Conversely, institutional support, which, you know, we might kind of think of as being the first point of call through PWDBA, um, thinking about the role of protection officers and so on. Um, actually, a very you know, tiny minority of people report to the police social service organisations, religious leaders, uh, doctors, um, and even a you know, smaller number report to, the, to lawyers. Um, so we have a, you know, a situation where, you know, what does justice kind of mean in this context? I mean, perhaps there's a discussion around, so we had around what is the difference between help seeking and attempts to access justice. Um, and certainly that's something we're, we're looking to try and understand more through, through the testimonies and narratives of, of survivors in terms of how do they understand um, uh, access to justice? What is it that you know, the, an ideal outcome would be in the situation? And this, you know, the kind of um, responses here are really quite complex, they're quite contradictory as well. Um, and it's certainly, there's not a sort of singular narrative around, of course, um, you know, wanting uh, to exit relationships, for example. It's actually kind of more, more complicated. So many would actually talk about wanting to live peacefully um, so that is kind of staying within relationships, but for violence to, to end. Um, others would talk about wanting to live peacefully you know, outside of, of um, households and relationships, you know, at, at any, any cost. Um, there's strong narratives around um, seeking justice in terms of right to subsistence and, and shelter, um, and particularly uh, strong uh, narratives around economic justice, especially where children were concerned. So women often found it um, seem to be kind of more of um, forthright about their rights where they're seeking to protect their children and also also felt that those with those articulations of rights would be more kind of uh, listened to or heard by by the legal institutions by the state um, and then finally thinking about I mean this is just kind of a, a sort of snapshot of some of the narratives um, but obviously thinking about justice as, as digni dignity so for women um, you know that kind of physical violence or sexual violence or uh, domestic violence is one thing but it, the injury to reputation that the violence uh, an inju injury to reputation and relationships that survivors incurred through domestic violence brought a certain amount of shame but also dismantled and just you know, destroyed relationships around them whether at work or through family um, and so on and and so there's a sense of sort of um, wanting to restore uh, you know, dig dignity through seeking help through seeking justice um, but Shazi will turn to the main sort of substantive um, work thinking about um, access to, to law, access to justice through legal institutions. Thanks, Philippa. So what I'm going to do, oh, sorry, I forgot, <laughs> I'm so sorry to give this slide, I just want to look at it, which I think Philippa was talking about in the last couple of sentences. Um, yeah, so you can see their safety of children, justice is dignity as well. And just moving on very quickly. So what I'm going to talk about are uh, the barriers to um, access and justice, which we um, have got just to give you an overview, really, as I say, we're at a very early stage in terms of the kind of uh, sort of deep detailed analysis. But these these issues are definitely coming through in terms of all three states that we um, have analysed and, and done work in. First of all, uh, problematic attitudes, which I'm so sure won't be a surprise to anybody working in this field towards victims of domestic abuse from the police and legal professionals, um, limited availability of legal aid. Uh, lots of delays in court proceedings, lots of issues there, which I'll talk about also. Um, lack of training and resources, particularly for protection officers, uh, considering they're the sort of central linchpin, really, of this reform. Uh, that's very concerning. And then also, as a result of all of that, the deployment, really, of informal mechanisms for justice. So it kind of exacerbates the situation uh, in terms of women, therefore, turning away from formal justice and moving towards informal justice uh, mechanisms. So I'm just going to talk about those uh, four aspects in a little bit more detail now. Um, so, first of all, in terms of the uh, problematic attitudes, I say it won't be very much a surprise. Um, 
I thought actually that uh, out of the uh, the small number that do go to the police, it, it, it was a positive that women did actually feel they could go to the police, which is you know not always the case in uh, in lots of places. So they did. Uh, there was a fairly high percentage of women who did go to the police in each state. However, most of them didn't find them very helpful, as you can see from the uh, the quotes there in terms of Maharashtra, um, in terms of West Bengal, and also in terms of Tamil Nadu. Uh, you can see therefore that. Um, there's lots of problems in terms of blaming the survivors for husband's violence, uh, trivialising the violence by claiming that these things are normal. Um, and as you can see there in Maharashtra, uh, that's a particularly uh, difficult case where the officers just simply were not clearly doing their job. Um, there's also evidence of re-victimising women um, as well, uh, normalising violence and urging victims to adjust to abuse, um, which is uh, particularly problematic. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, we also heard um, a lot about uh, police officers conducting, uh, right, my pronunciation is going to be terrible, um, Kasa Panchayatu, informal kangaroo courts uh, in the name of conflict resolution. So they're also uh, participating in <laughs> informal conflict resolution, which is clearly not their role in terms of legal enforcement. Um, and as you can see there, uh, one NGO said in Tamil Nadu that the police support whoever approaches them first and whoever can pay them. So there are also concerns around corruption, uh, which doesn't exactly um, uh, lead to much more um, confidence in the system. Um, and it was quite clear also from West Bengal that the interviews made it evident that the police consider reconciliation as part of their mandate and also a testimony of success, which is also clearly very concerning. Um, there were also problematic attitudes in terms of lawyers, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you can see here some very problematic attitudes. Survivors' opinions about lawyers were actually mixed. Um, in a few cases, survivors found their lawyers to be helpful, um, who didn't charge them high fees and followed up their cases. Um, survivors who accessed lawyers through NGOs um, had fairly positive feedback of their lawyers in respect of whether they got a significant sum for maintenance. Um, however, there were some you know, um, quite difficult um, uh, discussions around uh, some difficult uh, behaviour by lawyers. Uh, so whilst it's acknowledged there were some good lawyers, some lawyers, however, some women rather, thought that they were quite mercenary. Uh, and this is quite interesting from uh, also from other stakeholders too, not just from survivors. Um, um, so the comments such as they view women as cases, they're loyal to whoever pays their fees, uh, lawyers help clients escape punishment by finding loopholes, and they also strike deals with other lawyers that have nothing to do with the survivor's welfare. There were also issues concerning attitudes of not believing women and also this um, this issue that we picked up quite a bit uh, in India about uh, an attitude that women misuse uh, the law. And there's a particular uh, section there, 498A, uh, which seems to be particularly problematic. So you can see, therefore, that the lawyers themselves um, have quite problematic attitudes towards um, what women are actually doing in terms of when they are, when they do access the law, that, that they're misbelieved and they're, and they're regarded as uh, somehow misusing the system. And that's obviously not great. Um, and then in terms of uh, legal aid and court delays, you can see there um, from the quotes from all three uh, states uh, that there are severe problems. There are two types of lawyers, really, who deal with domestic violence cases in India, private lawyers and state government appointed uh, district uh, legal services authority uh, and state legal services authority lawyers. And basically the choice between these two kinds of advocates is based on accessibility, financial affordability, competence and experience. Um, so although we've got this concept of DL DLSA, DLSA and SLSA, um, the intent behind that was to provide essential and eff efficient legal help to those who can't afford it. What we've found, however, um, in the research so far um, is that it's actually very, very difficult to access those lawyers. So although they're supposed to be free, there's also another problem, which is there's a general lack of awareness amongst women uh, who approach them about what benefits they're actually entitled to. So, for example, in one of the cases, um, free certified copies of orders and results um, uh, and records. And, and as a result, there were claims that there, this results in corruption, uh, where money is actually demanded from women when it should not be. Um, and so that's a real problem. Uh, lawyers reported that paralegal vol uh, paralegals volunteer under this scheme uh, and the idea is that it's more accessible. Um, but there was very limited uh, awareness of this uh, from uh, survivors themselves. And there's clearly a lack of trust among survivors, uh, as well as other stakeholders on the competence and, and in some cases integrity of this system. Um, another big issue that came up was a lack of, of judges, and, and uh, which has led to a backlog of cases in a lot of courts and the length of time it takes 
uh, in proceedings. And you can see there from one of the examples uh, in Maharashtra, somebody who's been dealing with this for the past 15 years. And there's some real structural issues around the way uh, the different uh, aspects of um, of a case of domestic violence actually work. So you've got the one court that deals with the uh, domestic violence act, and then you've got the family courts, and then you've got the maintenance court. And there clearly is a lack of joined up thinking, which which causes real problems in terms of uh, how survivors can actually, uh, you know, they require a holistic response, and instead they're having to navigate. Uh, three very complicated and difficult systems uh, to really get a solution for them uh, in terms of um, uh, financial help, uh, uh, help in terms of the violence, uh, and also uh, in relation to custody and access issues in relation to children. So there's a, there's a huge problem in terms of the structural uh, side of things um, also. Um, and you can see, therefore, lawyers are also talking about this too. In Tamil Nadu, they say in Chennai, there's only two PO. Um, and, and talks about how, how difficult it really is for uh, poorer people to actually access justice. Um, protection orders, uh, it was also reported, are very hard to obtain. Um, court delays, therefore, generally penalise survivors, it's felt. Um, and as a result of court delays, um, in particular, uh, for refugees and other marginalised groups, uh, this, this can mean, therefore, that legal separation is a preferred option over divorce. Um, and in terms of maintenance cases, um, most, in one case, one person said that as the court date nears, lawyers advise men to transfer their property to other family members and quit their jobs in order not to pay. Um, so there are real issues. Then quite apart from that, we haven't talked about um, the real problem of uh, women who live in remote areas who simply do not have access to a court. Uh, and it's very, very difficult for them to actually reach them. Um, in terms of resources, uh, this is really centred on uh, on the police protection officers, which, as I said earlier, was a sort of central linchpin, really, of this reform. This is supposed to be the, 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 the really positive aspect of it. And in general, um, most stakeholders, and particularly survivors, were quite um, had quite positive experiences with protection officers, um, which is good. Um, they're central to the machinery of the civil law on domestic violence, uh, because obviously they provide that vital link uh, of the complainant with the redressal mechanism, i.e. the legal system. Uh, however, most uh, protection officers reported not having received any training and orientation on the law, and also that there was little refresher training, and that's a huge problem. Uh, they further reported, as you can see there, uh, that their work is labour intensive um, and they're given very limited support to function. That was in West Bengal. Um, in Maharashtra, there were discussions about um, lots of tasks being given, not enough adequate facilities. Uh, and again, lack of training and awareness of it. And then also the um, there were some quite um, interesting comments from uh, NGOs as well, as you can see from Tamil Nadu. Um, there just seems to be a lack of awareness of the, of the protection officers um, in, the, in itself, which is really concerning given how long the act has been uh, in force. And as you can see there, three NGOs were saying uh, they, were, uh, they were critical of, about them, um, but also that they just weren't, um, they weren't really aware that they actually um, existed as um, uh, as a possibility under the Act. And so that's a, that's a problem as well. So there's a lack of awareness in some, some areas about the role of protection officers full stop. And generally, there's a problem in terms of resourcing and training protection officers and continuing that, tra uh, that training um, at all. But in general, it was a positive aspect of the Act. And that's one of the positives, I think, of the research that we've done. Um, and then as a result of all of this, what happens, therefore, I think, I mean, obviously it's happening anyway, but I think it, it, it compounds this, uh, uh, this, the issue uh, because the, the, there are huge barriers to accessing formal justice. And as a result, I think women, therefore, are more likely to turn to the informal mechanisms that actually exist. And the most common uh, accessed and prominent body in this category was the panchayat. Um, and lots of, um, lots of people, lots of stakeholders talked about um, how such mediations obviously can become double-edged swords uh, for women. Um, and women were usually loath to approach formal institutions like, uh, institutions like the police or the court to address their domestic matters because of issues around honour and, and privacy, etc. And uh, therefore, as a result, they often ended up um, approaching these types of institutions. Um, so, as you can see there from, uh, from the quote, uh, there, there seems to be a real traje trajectory of, of how women deal with domestic abuse in Tamil Nadu. First, you go to your parents' house, um, and then you might go to um, the, uh, the, the panchayat, and then if that doesn't work, then you go to the police station or the lawyer. So, it's, so it seems to be a, a kind of very sort of early stage uh, before actually approaching formal institutions. Um, 
And as you can see there, there were also, there's also evidence of religious boards and committees as well being um, being another source of informal resolution or uh, that some women uh, went to, but they often didn't have very good experiences of that, as you can see there. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it, it did work, as you can see in Maharashtra, another survivor stage, she approached the masjid and they told her husband to behave well. Um, the other um, area or the other sort of type of informal uh, resolution with mediation by tribal councils, which was observed in West Bengal. Um, and actually that was, um, um, sorry, Mahara, um, in Maharashtra. Um, and that was, um, <laughs> that was interesting. Um, one of the survivors didn't accept the unjust verdict that she actually received uh, from the tribal council in which she was advised to submit to her husband and pay his loans. And then she went and filed a case under the act uh, making it the first case in the region. Uh, that sounds great. However, she then suffered severe criticism of the village tribal council uh, for having taken her grievance out of the village, and then they persuaded her to withdraw it. So you can see that the informal systems that are going on within, particularly within rural locations, actually act as a huge barrier to women then access, accessing formal um, justice mechanisms. But then, as I've just outlined, the formal justice mechanisms themselves are not exactly um, providing good redress either. And so um, that's, that was, I think, one of the most interesting aspects of the, of the research, really, in terms of this informal mechanisms of justice and how, this, uh, how, how they actually work, because there's clearly um, a lacuna in that sense uh, between the formal system and what women actually, um, the, the reality of what they uh, achieve in terms of justice. And very often, particularly for rural women, justice does mean these informal mechanisms of justice. They won't necessarily go to the police and they won't necessarily go to a court or even see a lawyer. This is what they actually experience in terms of a sort of general concept um, of justice. And that's obviously um, quite problematic. Um, and the role of religion in there uh, is also, uh, I think, uh, quite interesting too. Um, but as we can, <laughs> but as we know, these uh, institutions are often not the best uh, to deal with what is essentially patriarchal violence because they often, in fact, um, uh, make that uh, situation worse uh, and actually end up kind of reinforcing patriarchal norms, particularly around what women should expect to uh, put up with in a relationship. Leading thoughts, Philippa? Um, well, I know we've been asked to wrap up, so um, maybe we can just leave it at that and come yeah. back to, to these later on in the discussion. Yeah, that's fine. OK, I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you. That was fascinating, I must say. One second, let's see. Thank you, Shazia and Philippa. That was very interesting insights. To some extent, reaffirming a lot of what we have seen, but, you know, really putting together narratives and seeing the fact that it exists even today. And we do know that the informal justice uh, mechanisms fail women again and again. In some of the rural areas now, women are being trained as paralegal workers, para health workers, to essentially be the frontline respondents mm -hmm. to domestic and other forms of gender-based violence. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back to you because I think uh, there are some mm -hmm. interesting insights that you have shared with us. I would now like to invite Sarah, Sarah Hussain, who uh, is a very well-known feminist advocate, a researcher, and uh, is from the Bangladesh Legal Aid and Services Trust. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to try to share my PowerPoint. Just hope that works. Um, sorry, this may be... Is it possible for one of you to do it? Sorry, I have a new computer and I'm a bit uh, dodgy on how to make it work properly. Uh, Pragna, would you be able to share it? Uh, Amrita. Amrita, uh, would you be able to share it? Sorry, please. Uh, put her email address yes, in the chat. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm just trying to sort it out. Um, I'm, let me just say what I'm going to speak about while this is happening. Um, I think that was a wonderful presentation, and I think it kind of spoke to very uh, a, a kind of a lot of common issues that certainly we see in Bangladesh as well, with our domestic violence act very much modeled on the Indian one, and in a similar, in in a somewhat uh, in a very very similar context, I would say. 
Um, just give me a second while I just send this across. Um, so I, I actually wanted to talk a bit more about uh, what uh, uh, Sunita referred to just now about how the use of paralegal programs and other initiatives to try and address some of the barriers we see in terms of access, how we've kind of worked on that um, and see what kind of difference that makes and what kinds of challenges still remain. I mean, I'd like to say, as we often do in court, that I adopt all of the submissions of my learned friends, Shazia and Philippa, because I think most of those are, are very relevant um, to us. Um, okay, so I'm just sending this through to you, Prajna, if you can just see, hopefully you'll get it right now. Uh, Amitta, this is coming to you. Yes, ma'am. Um, it's called I'm um, sorry, presentation. It was going straight through to you. Amrita, have you got it? No, ma'am. I think it's just going, yeah. It's just yeah. going. Um, so, yeah, I'll start in the meantime while it's uh, coming up. Um, so I think uh, the, the first, the sort of, I think the points of departure are very similar. I just want to sort of start with what the the legal framework is for us and just sort of remind us as, ourselves of that a bit, because I think it will be common across the region, you know, that we have these uh, quite strong quite robust constitutional mandates for equality. And those are referenced in our domestic violence legislation. And those are very much this kind of starting point for when feminists were working now almost uh, a dozen years ago on framing the domestic violence legislation in Bangladesh. And it, it pulled, it really drew on the Indian experience. We had Indian colleagues from Lawyers Collective actually who informed us we were involved in exchanges and so on. So very similar framework, but as I said, similar but different context, which, which makes for, I think, very important sort of differences in terms of how the implementation has or hasn't happened. Um, I think some of the crucial points about our framework is although we have this strong constitutional mandate for equality, we of course know that that lives alongside a lot of very contradictory, continuing, persistent discrimination in terms of the legislation, and that we have a legislative framework which inhabits three different centuries. So we have all the colonial era stuff, you know, penal code, etc., which criminalizes certain forms of violence, including various forms of domestic violence, violence that occur within the family. And we have this other architecture, which is our personal law system, which really does inform what our choices are in terms of responding to domestic violence, what our capacities are for provide, le obtaining legal protection and the limits of that. So I think we really need to understand that the personal law framework, the criminal law framework, and this constitutional mandate of equality are the things that intersect with the specific domestic violence legislation and that limit in many ways how that domestic violence law can actually operate in practice. Uh, again, much of what Shazi and Philip already says applies to the Bangladesh domestic violence law. It has this expanded, def it has a definition for a start of what domestic violence is. It defines it as physical, um, psych psychological, financial or sexual violence. Um, it provides civil remedies in terms of protection orders, residence orders, maintenance orders, etc. It also importantly, I think, does provide duties on the police, on the health service, and on service providers, which includes CSOs, civil society organizations, women's groups, legal groups like ours, BLAST, and so on. Um, and in some ways, I, I take that point that that's also, that can have limiting effects and that it somewhat takes away responsibility from other state authorities, but it also, I think, has an enabling role, which is it in a context where civil society is increasingly marginalized, increasingly challenged in terms of how it can operate. It gives a certain and important legitimacy and ability to operate within the system and to, uh, to sort of foster collaboration with state agencies as well. One of the really challenging limits of our legislation in addition to the exclusions that were already mentioned about people with disabilities and, and sexual minorities, 
um, is the exclusion of divorced women from the ambit of protection of the domestic violence law. And I think the process of, the, of how that happened is also important. We had a large coalition of, of women's and rights organizations working together um, on framing this legislation. But at the last stage, when it went for vetting, the final round, nobody noticed that the definition of who was entitled to remedies had been changed to exclude divorced women. In fact, we found out to our shock much later when we were litigating the first cases and had an applicant who was a divorced woman who just discovered this, you know, when she was finally in front of the magistrate. So I think that is a huge exclusion, a huge problem in terms of who can access and who can't access. Uh, if you're, uh, you don't know if you're able to share the screen, Prajna, have you got it? Uh, no, ma'am, I have messaged you. I haven't you got me. your presentation for some reason. Yeah. I've oh. shared my ID with you. I've tried, yeah, I've tried resending it. Um, but Sarah, you are so okay. lucid when you speak. I'll just carry on. To yeah, to look you get the it. presentation shirt. Yeah, I'm just looking at it at my end. Okay. Um, so I just want to make one other point about the laws before explaining, maybe before discussing this one example I want to talk about um, of how we designed a program to try and address one of the challenges in terms of uh, implementing the laws, which is uh, around access uh, to affected people, affected women. Um, in terms of the legal framework, I think we do need to look at what the person law framework is and what the exclusions are there. Um, the fact that there are different rights in terms of the, the fact that, first of all, you know, age of marriage is an issue that you can, despite having a universal law on child marriage restraint, which criminalizes child marriages of girls under 18, boys under 21, we have Muslim person law that allows um, essentially child marriages and it makes them valid. Uh, leaves them valid. Uh, Hindu family law allows marriage of a child at any age. And under Muslim law, at least you have to reach puberty first. You need your guardian's consent um, before that. But uh, Hindu marriage law allows marriage, child marriage at any age. So these things are coexisting and, and problematic in many ways. Um, divorce laws are hugely limiting. So Muslim women can divorce. And generally under marriage contracts that are made, divorce rights are given. Um, but for Hindu women, there's no, except for certain castes, there's no divorce rights at all. For Christian women, divorce rights are incredibly restricted, again, under 19th century legislation, sort of Victorian era legislation. Um, another set of laws that's become increasingly relevant, I think, in terms of dealing with uh, particular forms of domestic violence now is in terms of cyber violence as well. So we have, for example, the Digital Security Act and the Pornography Control Act, but you know, premised on quite problematic definitions, using definitions of well, using the un a certain understandings of obscenity. Um, the Digital Security Act is one of our most draconian and problematic bits of legislation, and that is primarily now used to deal with various forms of cyber violence and threats. A lot of which does occur within the context of domestic violence, and particularly when marriages are uh, breaking up. Um, so I think we need to look at those laws as well. And I think the the big challenge for us is is massive lack of data. So we don't have easily accessible data in terms of um, filings under the DV Act itself, but we don't have data from relating to this other legislation, which correlates uh, in terms of domestic violence cases. So for example, with the, DS, with the Digital Security Act, uh, we don't have easily accessible data from any authority, whether courts or police, about how many cases are being made around, for example, um, revenge porn cases. So we can't correlate them together. Uh, similarly, if we want to look at divorce cases or we want to look at cases under the special legislation we have on violence against women, um, we can't connect all of these together. There has been, there was a very interesting initiative by the Bangladesh government to set up something called the Justice Audit. I'll put the link in the chat when I finished, uh, which did look at district-wise information, uh, data from police and from courts, uh, but looked at filings only under certain definitions. It didn't look at DV, it did look at rape. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to have 
continued. It was, of course, done under some kind of project, um, supported, I think, by the FCDO in the UK and the German uh, aid agency. And it continued till about 2016, but we don't have any data subsequent to that. But that shows you some picture and you can tr track a little bit. But I think this, this absence of data also makes it very difficult for us to understand, I think, what some of the patterns are and that, that we have to look at in terms of how the legislation intersects. Um, now, in terms of the problem, I mean, we've had the DV law in place, as I said, for 12 years now. We've got unusually, as we don't have for many laws, we actually have rules in place as well, also pushed very much and catalyzed by the work of uh, the broad coalition that worked on the domestic violence legislation. Um, but we have very, very few cases happening under the DV Act. I mean, in recent research um, done by Action Aid Bangladesh showed that there were some districts where not even a single case had been filed under this legislation. Um, and some of the reasons for that that have been identified by researchers like um, Shainaz Huda working with Plan International and Taslima Yasmin with Action Aid. Uh, first of all, a massive lack of national awareness still of the fact that there are specific protections available under domestic violence law. And noting that while there is increased awareness of domestic violence as a wrong for which remedies are available, there's very little awareness of what those remedies are and very little awareness of where you can go to access those services uh, for, for remedies and protection. And of course, massive limited access to legal services. There is a government legal aid program. There are district legal aid offices. Um, there are national organizations like BLAS, like huge NGOs like BRAC, other smaller women's organizations that do provide legal services. But even then, nothing near enough to cover the need. Um, and there's a lack of correlation between, uh, again, lack of information too, and lack of access to available safety nets that would actually enable women and girls who are affected by domestic violence to have the wherewithal to seek services and to sustain themselves as they continue the search for and uh, for, for effective remedies. Um, and the lack of the lack of uh, shelters, which is already mentioned again, I think, by Philippa and Shazia, the lack of effective counseling process, the lack of security uh, are critical reasons why this law can't really work on its own. And I think it's kind of important to do maybe a mea culpa on this as well. So I think as activists, when we were working on the legislation, we were extremely honed in on how do we get the law in place and much less of our advocacy focused on how do we put in all the things that are needed to make the law work, although we're aware of it because we work on those issues. But I think this focus on the law and all that was useful to have a law which provides civil protections in the absence of particularly economic uh, support, financial support and social and uh, support and shelter, it's not realistic to expect, I think, that that legislation to work in any way. So I want to just talk in my probably very few minutes left about a particular um, intervention that we made from BLAS called Shoki. Um, and this intervention was premised on this understanding that what we need to do is get information not only about the rights to protection from domestic violence and the remedies available, but also specific services in a particular context to the women who might be affected by DV and the threat of it, as well as those who are, who are actually already affected and, and need support and protection. So the Shoki uh, initiative was something that was started um, a few years ago. Uh, it's, it's wrapped up now, but we're doing similar initiatives based on that. Um, it was started in informal settlements in Dhaka city, including Korail, which is the largest, I think, basti or, or settlement of this kind outside after Dharavi in Bombay. Um, and the idea was to work in a community so that we could create access to government and NGO-led services, to the police, to, for example, marriage registrars, to local clinics, and to the government's architecture of responding uh, in cases of violence against women, which included police-run victim support centers and the one-stop crisis center, which is in the medical college hospital in Dhaka city. Now you could say, well, one, one medical college hospital, one one-stop crisis center in a city of over 14 million people, where going from that informal settlement in Coral to the one crisis center can take you three hours or at worst in the worst traffic, maybe one hour in better traffic. It's not, those are clearly not accessible spaces. So how do you, how do you make them accessible and what do you do? 
we thought the best way to work this was again a little bit from our realization that being lawyers and a legal aid organization in blast we were over focusing on the law we thought the important things were to do were to supplement and fill the gaps that we had not seen when we were working on on making the law um and that was to first of all provide information so we had um we worked, first of all, we worked, we decided we had to make this an intervention that was not only about and by lawyers. So it was done through a consortium, including a health organization, um, the Bangladesh Women's Health Coalition, a women's activist organization called We Can, um, or Amra Pari, uh, and another health organization, Mary Stopes. Uh, and this combination meant that we had in every community that we worked in, we had a hub. Um, where we had a paralegal and a, para a community health worker in a, working in operation together in the hub. So we had um, we had uh, a, a hub which was just you know a very small little space inside the community, uh, separated often just by a curtain between the community health worker and the paralegal. Why, why was that a critical critical intervention? Because we found that in these communities. And in general, across Bangladesh, uh, we'd seen research showing that there was very little, women felt little reservation or inhibition about going in to see a health worker for health services, including reproductive health services, to come in to get their pills, to get a paracetamol, uh, it was completely fine. But coming in to see a legal worker had a lot of stigma attached to it, because then people know that you've got a problem. And even greater stigma if you're coming to report violence against women or domestic violence. So having this combination meant people could come into the door to see the health worker, pull the curtain aside and pop in to see the paralegal. And it worked like a charm. We got a much greater number of women coming in to report and to seek advice as a result. The second intervention was, so, and of course, when they got to the paralegal, they could get a response to whatever specific query they had. But another, another arm of this intervention was not only to wait for someone to come in with a problem. So we had community awareness sessions, uh, courtyard sessions, as they were called, run by the paralegals in the communities, talking about these are your rights, these are the protections you can get, and this is where you can go for it. So providing absolutely detailed information of that kind. And we found again in our experience that that's necessary unless you have that with you, it's very difficult to take any action. We also intervened not only with potentially those who could be affected, but with the community at large. So there were other awareness sessions run with community leaders and with, with, with the public in this community um, to again give them information. And we found that in fact had a, again massive payoff because later on when we saw women coming forward to seek assistance, we found that their neighbors would come forward to assist them and the community leaders, rather than being barriers, which they had been in the past, actually facilitated access in some cases to the police, in some cases to the, uh, to the legal aid lawyers who, who were available and, and able to be contacted. And a third arm to this intervention was working on, on strengthening confidence. So particularly for the for adolescent girls and, bo and for some boys, we had programs that were focusing on uh, building their skills and capacities. So there were programs around, for example, self-defense, uh, karate classes, which were run by actually other kids from the community with a small women's organization that focused on this issue. Um, one small thing on coding classes and a much bigger one, uh, which again, I just want to talk about very briefly, which was a football tournament. Um, so we, and, and these were all really aimed with trying to break this barrier of, of women and particularly adolescent girls feeling that they couldn't speak, you know, the whole the sort of stigmatizing, shaming kind of space. So the football tournament became something really important alongside all of these legal and health interventions and so on. When we started it out, so I'll just be wrapping up, Sunita, one more minute. When we started it out, we found that there's massive resistance. Families said nothing doing. There's no way our girls are going to play football. Uh, one, one, but but they were keen to do. There wasn't space. These are busties without much open space. But little little bits were carved out, and local schools gave some space. One woman had her young woman had her arm broken by her husband because she wanted to come and play football and insisted on doing it. By the third year of this intervention, we had the parents beating down our doors to get their girls onto the team. 
By the third year, we also, I think at that point, we had uh, threats from various groups that, you know, fundamentalist groups saying they wouldn't allow girls to play. The girls said, we're going to play no matter what. And they went out there and did it. Um, and, and I think we found these three things, the confidence building, the information awareness, and the access on site to people who would provide information and who would then provide accompaniment to go to a particular service that was needed made the difference. And we got we got uh, people asking for help. Um, we were able to provide some of the help. But as I just want to end with, I think, a sort of a question and a challenge to ourselves that we were able to meet some of those gaps that we saw in terms of access. But what we weren't able to do um, was change what was being asked for. So except in the most extreme cases uh, where, there were, where there was litigation and there were criminal cases filed and so on, in most cases, nobody was asking for any kind of accountability. So they didn't want to activate the criminal laws. What essentially women wanted in these situations was some kind of economic justice. So they were asking for maintenance payments. Um, and we found that all of the obstacles that have already been discussed were very much in place and in play there because we could get some of that solved through mediations and ADR and so on on the ground through our paralegals and through our staff lawyers. But anytime anything went into court, we faced all of the problems that were there. So that's another story and I hope we can come back to that. But I think this was a small example of how we tried to deal with one of the problems that we face in terms of uh, activating our legislation. And I haven't talked about all of the things we did in terms of advocacy to, with the state authorities or in the local community and through strategic litigation to look at some of the issues in terms of the, the legal framework and the anomalies there. And hope, hopefully I have a chance to come back to that later. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sarah. Very, very fascinating uh, hub of services, as you say, that goes closer to the community and also renegotiates the social norms and terms and conditions of how women and girls can get access to both services, information, and also to their rights. Uh, I think there are these are the examples that we must document and share across the region, because I was just thinking it's 12 years to the law in Bangladesh. It's about, what, 17 years in India. And I know activists are talking about doing a comprehensive study and perhaps these are thoughts moving forward. Um, I'd like to now uh, invite um, Saba from Dastak Trust Pakistan. Over to you, Saba Sheikh. Uh, 20 minutes time. I know we are running a bit short, but please take your time. Please put your key points ahead and over yes. to you. Thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. Um, I hope everyone can see the screen. Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Um, so, okay, um, so a lot of um, the observations that have been made in the past presentations, um, you know, apply to Pakistan. And I think I, in my presentation, I'm looking to see a lot of commonalities in terms of the kind of barriers that we face in terms of access to justice, uh, implementation of laws. Um, so just uh, before I sort of start the actual discussion, I just want to say in the context of Pakistan, when I'm talking about uh, access to justice, I, I, I mean legal protection, legal awareness, legal, um, you know, adjudication, representation, enforcement of laws, civil society oversight. So all of that sort of is covered in, in, in access to justice. And these are the kind of areas that we want to work on uh, improving when we talk about improving uh, access to justice. Um, so the two things that I would really be focusing on uh, in my presentation today is to, of course, highlight the mechanisms that do exist in Pakistan, particularly in Punjab, uh, of, to improve access to justice for women, particularly domestic violence survivors, uh, and then and then focus on the importance of emergency shelters, transition homes, and economic opportunities as a strategy to combat domestic violence and an essential element to improve access to justice uh, for survivors of violence. Because I'm a practitioner, so most of my experiences and what I'm observations uh, draw from my experiences of working with survivors of violence for, for the past like 10 to 14 years. Um, 
So let me start by saying that the Constitution of Pakistan does guarantee equality of all citizens. Um, you know, it, 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 it empowers the state to make special provisions for the protection of women and children, uh, where the, the general law sort of fails or falls short. And, you know, in that respect, in terms of domestic violence, we have been able to create these mechanisms particularly catered to uh, survivors of violence. We had I mean, in 2013, the first domestic violence law was introduced in Pakistan, which was in the province of Sindh, uh, which was then followed by Balochistan, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, uh, Punjab, and then uh, uh, and then we also have one in Islamabad, which is in the, the center. Uh, so we have uh, these laws which exist. We also have state-run emergency shelters which have been operating under the social welfare department that we have uh, in the country. And the, we, in Punjab, for example, we have it in all 36 districts of Punjab. So women have access to these shelters. Um, uh, and then we have them in other in, in lesser numbers, but in other provinces also. We have crisis centers, which are basically non-residential facilities where women who are not seeking shelter, but they want legal aid, um, you know, counseling services, mediation, they can access these crisis centers for that kind of support. Uh, under the domestic violence law, uh, we were able to create the first violence against women center, which was created in Multan. It was, it was based on a one-stop model, which was aimed at bringing all services together. Uh, we are, of course, still struggling in terms of uh, um, fully establishing it and sort of create, running it according to its spirit and the way the law sort of envisaged it to be run. Uh, but it, it's a great initiative and it, it's just the kind of services that we feel survivors need, uh, given the sort of socioeconomic conditions from most in which they sort of hail from in our country. We also have specialized GBV courts. Uh, I have also been set up uh, here in Punjab and in other provinces, uh, which cater to uh, gender-based violence cases. Uh, currently, they're only dealing with sexual violence cases, but we're hoping that this sort of will increase their mandate uh, over the years. One thing I do want to highlight is the major gap that we have in domestic violence law. So it is, it's largely a procedure, it's a protective law, uh, where once an incident of domestic violence has happened, it provides these remedies which can be given to the survivor. Except in Islamabad, which is the, the capital city, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, none of the other provinces have really penalized or criminalized domestic violence. So if we want to uh, really go towards criminal litigation, we have to go through the General Criminal Procedure Code and the Pakistan Penal Code that we have. But under this law, we can only find remedies, uh, but it doesn't particularly, uh, it doesn't specifically punish the person who has uh, committed an act of uh, domestic violence. Um, again, implementation, of course, remains a challenge. Um, you know, in Punjab, for example, only till a few weeks ago, it was notified for all of Punjab. Uh, from 2016 till 2022, it was only applicable in one district, Pujan, which is Multan, where we've also set up the Violence Against Women Center. Um, so, you know, having said that we have all these facilities, um, I mean, do women really go to all these mechanisms that have been created for women? Uh, women still continue to have very traditional and informal means of finding uh, support when they survive with the domestic violence. Uh, mostly they try to resolve their issues by going to local sort of panchayats or elders in the community. Um, and if, for example, if that doesn't work out, they will reach out to their relatives or friends within the communities who can probably link them up to other possible options. Uh, but seeking legal help, which is courts, police, lawyers, NGOs, is something which it's, it's, it's something that it only its last resort measure for more survivors of violence. And, and this is largely because there is a whole list of barriers which are preventing women from reaching these services. Um, these are structural, social, attitudinal, economic, there are multiple sort of issues which they're dealing with. Uh, of course, in terms of legislation, there is lack of consistencies, consistency in law in some of the, like I explained in some countries, it, in some provinces, it has been um, criminalized while it's still not, it's a criminal act in other provinces. But problem lies not so much in legislation, right? it's more in terms of the approach and sort of approach, uh, enforcing that legislation, um, you know, and, and then sort of the social conditions that exist here. And of course, in patriarchy runs really deep and it's found in so many different ways. I mean, you could find it in, in, in the form of religion, family values, traditions, and it, it's and these this is constantly impacts a women's capacity to seek justice. Um, you know, in Pakistan, women's rights of freedom and choice and movement are severely restricted, uh, you know, in, in, in the name of modesty or protection. And, they, you know, they, they're 
they consider to uh, epitomize uh, honor and therefore any sort of step measure that they take uh, for their rights seems like they're bringing dishonor to the family. Um, you know, there's a, the, the conservatives here, you know, the, the principle that they very strongly believe is the concept of Chadar and Chad Diwali, which basically means uh, women should stay behind a veil and within four walls. So which basically means irrespective of what's happening within four walls, if a dignity is being violated on a daily basis, but still this is a principle that they feel if it's violated, then it's sort of violating the entire sort of social fabric of the society. Um, not to say on the response side, things are, uh, you know, uh, considerably better because uh, a lot of times when women do come to seek help, uh, they're sort of put in this box of being, you know, the subject or a victim instead of really looking at her individual preferences and choices. And therefore that also limits uh, you know, the legal provisions that have been developed for her safety and access to justice because uh, we're not really catering to her sort of requirements or what she her needs, her wants. Um, and this is largely because state institutions lack the sensitivity and capacity. We, over the years, we've had women police stations, we've had gender-based violence courts, we have gender focal persons which have been created specifically to deal with these matters within the police, but it's still not enough. Uh, you know, I think they lack that kind of pro proactivity that is needed to uh, assist um, you know, survivors of violence and eventually uh, women go through this whole, uh, once who do decide to take action, they go through the secondary victimization that happens once they uh, enter the system, which discourages a lot of women to seek help. Um, so over the years, of course, um, you know, there, there have been changes, there has been more legal aid that's being provided by, um, you know, at the government level and also at the private level. But that's, I mean, if you look at the experience of, of women litigants, they're still not happy and they, you, you do realize that legal aid alone is not enough and that's why I say you know services like shelters and economic opportunities are very important to, for women to really take a stand because half the time women uh, do not have these options and they, they prefer to stay in an abusive relationship then step out of uh, you know, because of insecurity and not being able to have that kind of like social setup or protective setup there, which will give, give them safety. So, you know, the social stigma again uh, of women opting, uh, opting out of family homes is also immense. Uh, and then let alone women who get involved in litigation because there's no financial security, legal protection for them. Then there's a stigma of being divorced. And so basically uh, it just leaves them, you know, for, it exposes them further to exploitation, ex you know, oppression, especially if they're poor and, and they don't have employable skills. And therefore, again, coming back to my point, I feel it's really important for, for, the, for the, 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 there's a need for increased focus on, you know, economic opportunities to be created for women. Um, of course, there's certain very specific practical barriers, which is reaching the most vulnerable women. Um, you know, there's lack of information, awareness, like most of the other speakers have also said, access to justice really starts with having knowledge of services. And uh, women, there's, there's um, also, we, and, and, and there's a very strong assumption here that that we were also assuming that, you know, because of the social media culture, there's so, you know, the information penetration has perhaps become, uh, you know, it's easier or it's become more widespread, but um, we, 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 we do a lot of community awareness programs and uh, just lately we did a community awareness program bang in the middle of Lahore, which is one of the biggest cities in uh, in Pakistan. And um, you realize a lot of women, they still did not have phones, let alone smartphones. Uh, they did not have, each of them did not have television in their house. So really it means that we still have to stick to very traditional ways of creating and spreading information and not rely too much on, uh, you know, technology in that sense. And of course, it's a digital divide also. Uh, you know, there'll they'll be male members will have access to internet telephones more than women will have it. So again, that also limits their ability to access information. Um, you know, helplines, a lot of times women don't have telephones, sometimes they can't reach helplines. Um, and then another barrier from a, from a responder side is that women don't possess relevant documents when we're trying to file their cases or trying to help them out if they, if they decide to take legal action because most of the time women in their households have very negligible control over their economic resources and decision making at family and community levels and therefore uh, most of the male members have sort of control over their sort of documents if they have it. A lot of times women don't even have their identification documents on them or never they've never had their ID card made or even have their birth registered. Um, so and then that this leads to uh, another issue which is the judicial and sort of law enforcement mindset. You know, uh, again that is a big sort of barrier towards women seeking the oftentimes their judicial pronouncements which reflect that negative bias. We've had a lot of cases and judgments where you see the judges are using their own sort of subjective morality instead of really looking at the law. And uh, and then the first and then another sort of major issue is, is, is this constant unhealthy sort of focus on reconciliation. 
most of the time when women come in, families come in, the first reaction of whether it's the police or of their community or their relatives would be to reconcile. Reconcile with the husband, reconcile with the family, because, because it's a very strong belief and they hold this family sort of unit so secret that they feel that, you know, she, ir irrespective of what she's going through, it's still the safest option for her is to, stay, to reconcile and go back and live in an abusive household. Um, and this, of course, then creates um, a lack of trust in the justice sector. Women are not interested in pursuing litigation. A lot of time, women who come to us, they're looking for the sort of like the quickest possible route for them to just escape that abusive relationship or marriage instead of, um, you know, really entering into any kind of litigation or, you know, they, they're not interested in punishing the abuser. They just want a safe option and a place where they can sort of uh, restart their lives or be safe and uh, and of course subsequently women don't report enough and therefore that also results and because of the judicial mindset the conviction rates also are very low um, and another issue which results in low conviction rates is also lack of evidence you know witness protection is weak in Pakistan police often tampers with evidence uh, so a lot of times women who even who start litigation they end up withdrawing cases or they reach some sort of compromise because they feel that's the easier uh, you know step to do um, so therefore, you know, in this sort of background, what is needed, like, you know, so, uh, and that's why we feel that, you know, safe living options and economic opportunities, while women are pursuing litigation, or women who want to come out of this uh, abusive relationship, it's really important for them to have these safe living options. And I think shelters provide them that kind of assurance that they'll be, they'll be safe. And so we need more uh, shelters, and not just emergency shelters, but also something which is modeled on the concept of transition homes or where they be given economic opportunities, irrespective of the fact whether they're educated, not educated, so that they know that they have another option. Remarriage is not the only option. Going back to an abusive household is not the only option. And, you know, so therefore, we feel at least at a point where, you know, we come to a point where we, we can eliminate domestic violence uh, for the short and medium term. At least we need to have shelters for women, which offer a complete package of services, um, and you know, with, and which are we ensure sensitive handling so women are sort of encouraged to come in where their dignity is respected. Uh, of course, we need more free legal aid and awareness. Uh, very inadequate services, uh, both at the government and the state level. Um, like a lot of, uh, um, you know, issues that lawyers uh, have, like Shalji identified in her presentation, similar things happen here. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of exploitation by lawyers also. Uh, therefore, I think we need to have more sort of quality legal aid that's given to women, to women and awareness uh, on their legal rights. Um, and I think we really need to bridge the gap between services and survivors through community interventions. Um, Dasta is a service provider, but we realized that we also had to work on uh, the external factors which give input to violence against women and we do have a very strong community awareness program but we're always still looking for more ideas and I, I'm looking at all of you in terms of how what kind of like campaigns and ways that we can create more awareness which is uh you know which is adapted to the the, the target audience and we, we're not using some kind of generic ways of just giving out information but it, that really helps in them gaining the right kind of knowledge and able to then as a result come and seek services um and other of course a uh, very important sort of strategy is to have a multi-sectoral approach is to we have all departments have to come and work together a survivor of violence has multiple needs a number of her rights have been violated and therefore it can't just be left to one particular like the social welfare department you know the health department the social welfare department government and the private sector all of and all other stakeholders really have to come together to eliminate uh, violence against women um and just lastly i just want to talk a little bit more about Dastak and you know why we feel that uh, Dastak was created in the first place was to fill these gaps. We wanted to sort of demonstrate that we can provide protection with dignity uh, and we can create these systems where women uh, are provided everything under one roof uh, while they stay safe and they are able to and they are able to attain justice, right? It's it's so that they don't get sort of discouraged midway. Uh, and we demonstrated that a, lo a lot of cases, we've handled over 9,000 cases of women and children. And we realized that we've largely been able to do because we are an open institution. We work collectively with all other institutions, whether it be at the health department or the courts or the police or other sort of private sector service providers. I think that uh, unity is really important. And I think, uh, uh, Laws will continue to have like their limitations, and so, but we have to learn to sort of 
um, interpret laws and be more creative with our legal solutions. And, and, and so it's, we can't tell a woman when she comes to us for help that we can't help you because at the moment the law doesn't it isn't, we don't have adequate laws. We just need to sort of interpret laws, uh, use them creatively and try to find solutions for her so that, you know, uh, the next woman that she talks to who is uh, 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 suffering from abuse is also encouraged to seek help. Thank you. Thank you, Sabha, for your fascinating presentation and also for highlighting some of the critical issues around the structural, social, latitudinal, and economic barriers. And so similar, we're seeing such similar issues across access to justice, access to freedoms, access to choice. You know, so many barriers that women have to suffer in um, making alternative arrangements for them and also in, in, in accessing their legal rights and uh, information around it. Um, I, we have only half an hour left and I do want to do justice to the process and I'd like to hand over the mic to Ermiza Tegal, who's a feminist lawyer in Sri Lanka and over to you Ermiza and then we will have about 10-15 minutes for the a round of questions and some closing comments from you. Over to you Ermiza, thank you. Thank you so much Sunita. Um, nice to be with everyone today. Uh, thank you very much also for having me on the panel. Um, I'm really actually happy to be going at the end of this panel because everything that needs to be said seems to have been said. Um, also, so much really similarities. I do apologize for my cough today. Um, so many similarities um, in what was said by the previous speakers and what's also happening in Sri Lanka. I think for us in Sri Lanka, we've also, um, I mean, as, as, as was said, the COVID pandemic and the, the lockdown restrictions uh, really demonstrated how, how difficult it was for women to access services. We saw also the immense increase in numbers of complaints that came in during that time. For example, just in the first 10 days, I think the National Committee on Women in Sri Lanka received 123 complaints of domestic violence. Uh, women in Need, a nonprofit organization working in Sri Lanka, 60% of their calls in the first two weeks of lockdowns were about domestic violence. Um, even now, Sri Lanka at this moment is going through a severe economic crisis. Uh, the numbers of um, domestic violence complaints and cases coming to us as practitioners, um, being handled by my colleagues and um, uh, institutions and organizations working on this issue, uh, we are seeing such an increase in the number. The economic pressures within the families are also resulting in, in violence within the families. Um, not just the numbers of violence, but also the form of violence, the severity of the violence is something that we are noticing uh, that has also become uh, uh, far, far worse than we have also experienced in the past. Um, and in these times, we also know that services are completely failing these victims. Uh, during the COVID pandemic, for example, uh, and the lockdown restrictions, we only noticed that advisory services was what was possible. And then all of the actual services required, even to, to come out of the house, to come out of your environment of uh, abuse or environment of violence was not possible for women. Access to justice was, um, was blocked. That was closed off for women during that time. Um, there was no visible outreach programs, particularly from the state. I know that there were non-governmental organizations, community service organizations that were trying to reach out. And um, domestic violence cases were not categorized as the urgent cases. Um, I remember going to court during that time. There were also restrictions on the, the types of cases that could be taken up, only urgent cases could be taken up. And uh, amused is, is, is a word I can use, I guess, but I would see that commercial matters would be urgent cases where, you know, some customs issue, some, some issue with uh, regard to banking or finances were considered urgent matters. But domestic violence, where your life, where your safety was in question, where um, you needed immediate uh, intervention were not considered urgent matters at the time. And a few of us really started raising the issue over social media at that time, 
trying to get um, get domestic violence cases at least. We also wanted maintenance cases. It didn't really come through. But there was at, at a point the Judicial Service Commission of Sri Lanka did issue a circular also categorizing domestic violence as an urgent case that could be taken up even if the lockdown prevailed. But it took such a lot of effort. I think it just demonstrates how deprioritized the issue of domestic violence is in countries like ours. I think um, Philippa and uh, Shazia really spoke to all of the socio-political context in which uh, the domestic violence laws in our countries uh, work. And uh, for Sri Lanka too, like India, the act comes in in 2005. It really focuses on the victim as opposed to the criminal law where it focuses on the victim as a witness. And we see um, protection orders being sought by victims. Um, but we also need to look at the implementation of this law, I think, as um, Sarah mentioned, in the context of our constitutions. And even though we have that commitment and guarantee of equality and non-discrimination, um, there are, uh, for example, in Sri Lanka, it's a fairly, it's an executive presidency. You understand how, how powerful uh, the executive presidency is. Um, where impunity then also draws that um, um, uh, it's where, where, where impunity actually comes from is also from within the constitution because if you look at the separation of powers within the constitution in Sri Lanka in particular, there is that weakness of the judiciary in terms of the powers of the judiciary uh, and the excess of powers with the executive body. Um, Sri Lanka also needs to be considered in its socio-political context of violence and impunity. So there's a long history of violence, even today, with the Prevention of Terrorism Act uh, being used against protesters in Sri Lanka. Um, and there is a high level of tolerance of violence, which I think even at a national level, when we're looking at it across the country, and it's the same thing that we experience in families, in intimate spaces, where impunity then, we, we recognize this this tolerance of violence and impunity. So it is, it is within this larger context that domestic violence is something that we are trying to address or assist victims of dom domestic violence. Um, I really wanted to say that laws, as, as I think mentioned by um, Sabah, they're really imperfect tools because they're products of our socio-political systems. And we recognize this when we work with it. Um, they, they sit, the Domestic Violence Act sits amongst laws that are very unfair on people. Um, and they don't recognize the experiences of women, for example, use of social media, cyber violence, like uh, was mentioned before, care work is not recognized. Um, uh, abortion is an issue that still needs to be addressed in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, marital rape is, uh, explicitly recognized in Sri Lanka. So when there are so many uh, aspects of domestic violence that uh, are not addressed in the law, it is very difficult to also move this little uh, piece of legislation which we uh, hailed at the time and was an important step forward. We have not been able to move in terms of institutional implementation for this, for the reason of this context. Um, and I think I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the women uh, who come to seek access. Um, I think from the very beginning, from the point at which before they come, even to us as, as lawyers, the context in which they operate or in, in which they live is a nobody's believe me, nobody believes me context. Uh, family and friends discourage outside help. Women complain that you know, if if I do this, I'll be considered a bad mother, a bad wife, uh, bring shame upon the family. All these things were said before as well. And we notice and studies have shown in Sri Lanka that it's always a last resort. So the person who comes to the law is someone who is not taking this option as a first, in the first instance, as a first option. Someone who comes to it completely depleted. And I think that lack of acknowledgement of this complete depletion of energy, of resources, of just emotional energy also to take this uh, path of access to justice or to, to seek redress even, uh, needs to be recognized. I think we, we talk about how, 
how issues are trivialized. But I think focusing on the person itself, on the woman itself and saying, this is the person, this is her very large experience of abuse. This is a very large experience of uh, being deprived uh, of these resources is something that we need to put forward. And that story needs to be told louder and fuller in courts, in public, in the media, so that we better understand and we don't, um, we, we fight that, that narrative of trivializing that, uh, that experience. Um, even the decision to access redress, whether it be services or whether it be legal services, brings about complete disruption to that, to that individual's life, to that person's life. And I think that needs to be acknowledged as well. So the person who comes to the law is, I, I sometimes show it as like this in an image of a full person and a much smaller person who comes to the law because of everything that the person bears. But just deciding to take a, a course of seeking redress or uh, accessing justice means that you're also disrupting your life in many ways. And as legal practitioners who have, who work with these cases, we know that we do so much, right? Before we go to the court, before we go to courts, we are looking at what are the security strategies? How does she find employment? How does she ensure her financial security? If in case the court does not grant what she is due or she is needed for her to sustain life for herself and her children most often, how does she travel to court? Um, how, do, how does her children travel to school uh, while the court case is going on? How are they safe? Where will she find accommodation? All these things need to be secured by her and those helping her before she gets to court. This is a huge burden. And I think just being able to, and, I, and I'm so glad that Sabah also spoke so much about services and there's been so much focus about services. And that's really where the state also in terms of law reform sometimes fails to, um, to develop because of the amount of resources that is required in providing services. Um, I think in Sri Lanka, we've had very many experiences of once we get to the courts as well, there is a burden on women to find where the perpetrator is, give addresses where summons can be served. Sometimes I've even seen uh, the women themselves have to go with the police officers to get the summons served, otherwise it's not served. So the burden of implementing the law also then falls on women. So, uh, and at very many levels when we have, when we don't acknowledge the experience of the victim or the survivor, we are basically, this, this, this law becomes more and more meaningless um, in, in this context. And there are so many hoops through which then women also have to jump. And we as lawyers, I think, then have a very different role to play in taking these cases forward. And I'll speak a little bit to that experience of myself and my colleagues. I think listening to the whole story and really spending that time with women so that we understand everything about or as much as possible about uh, her story is not just about taking a legal case forward, but also giving her a space to share that story. Validating each survivor's experience, ensuring that there is no blame because so much of the process, particularly the legal process, there, there will be many experiences and opportunities where sort of created where blame is laid at her feet. And then we have to be that barrier sometimes between uh, her and the system, um, sometimes physically standing uh, with her while uh, comments are made by other lawyers, sometimes by the judiciary that undermine her experience, right? Um, also very important is to treat victims as capable of taking decisions. I think when uh, survivors do come to us, there is, in my experience at least, there is that giving up of the taking of decisions. And I'm always asked, why don't you tell me what to do? Because you must know the law and you must know what the right thing to do is. And I have to keep uh, having this conversation, which I think I have found really very important is to say that actually you know your context best and I will tell you about the law and you will tell me about your experience 
and we will figure this out together, but we will take those decisions. And just having that uh, opportunity to take decisions about your own life, and it doesn't really work in the first few uh, meetings perhaps, and as, that, uh, as the court case moves forward and as the relationship moves forward, I've also seen people come into that space and take decisions for their own lives. And I think it's a really important part of the process. Uh, discussing options is a really important part of the process um, so that they get to choose. She gets to choose which, uh, how to assess her threats. I think she really does know best. She gets to choose which way forward and they do a much better job than us who, did, who only know the law really and the institutions that are able to tell and should tell them everything we know about the pitfalls, about the difficulties, about what they will face in court. Uh, that is where we bring information. Um, having the patience, I think, is something that we've all as practitioners learned, the going back and forth, uh, imperfect memories, um, patients with doubt, uh, not being sure whether to take this forward. Sometimes we don't take cases forward. We do everything that needs to get the case to being filed and then don't file. Um, but just staying with that process, I think, is really important that even if at any point in time they want to stop pursuing the case, that that option is available, that they're not locked into any process. And I think really that justice is an evolving experience for victims is something that um, is something that we need to keep reminding ourselves because she can change what she wants along the way. And sometimes she starts out with wanting just safety from violence and then economic security and then sometimes even justice in terms of uh, punishment or some kind of, uh, it, it really depends on the individual but that evolving experience of what justice means and what accountability means is, should always be also open. So I think really explaining the law is a large part of our work as, as practitioners. I'm not gonna to take too much of our time. I know we are also running a little short, um, but maybe I'll end on two points and there'll be some opportunity for some discussion. That I think we find when we come up, when, when laws such as the Domestic Violence Act get enacted, and we've been working on some amendments as well in Sri Lanka, that it's a one-off success, like law reform has happened. <laughs> um, but I think this needing to remind ourselves that it's an evolving process also, law reform. Once the act is in place, it needs to keep changing and changing every so often, learning from the experience of litigants uh, and becoming better at responding to them uh, the kind of um, academic or research work that needs to go into engagement with the law um, needs to be ongoing. And I would really like, I think we are also engaged in family law reforms right now in Sri Lanka. And just we're we are looking, as Sarah said, at, at trying to get the law in place. And then when we get it, we feel like we've reached some end and it's, it's, it's a victory in itself, which is true. But also then the long road ahead of continuing to improve these pieces of legislation so that they are better able, they're they are better implemented and they better suit the experiences of litigants is something that we need to uh, build in in terms of uh, the information that we gather from these laws. I think like the research that Philippa and uh, Shazia also presented, that needs to be an ongoing process. Um, and, and as I said before, I think just this acknowledgement of what a what a complete disruption um, the uh, choosing a path to access to justice is for a person. Uh, and the acknowledgement of that is an important part of um, uh, doing, doing this work, um, really understanding that there is so much more to show or so much more to make visible uh, in, in, the, in, in addressing domestic violence in our countries. Thank you. Thank you, Riza. We're really looking at what goes into the lives of survivors and uh, never forgetting their agency, their, their decision making, the disruptions that they have faced in their lives and giving them all the support that's possible so that they can take the decisions and move forward. So thank you for that. 
I do know that a Jagori over time in the communities that have been collectives of uh, survivors that go through a long legal literacy program and they also become a support counseling team for uh, other women who would like to uh, access the redress of justice system. Um, I'd like to open up, we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, we do have some, uh, not really, we have some experience uh, from Israt about the justice journey of 12 domestic violence survivors. Um, and we don't have any other questions, but if anyone wants to uh, make a comment, ask a question, just put up, raise your hand and I'd be happy to get you into the conversation. I'm glad to note that we've had a steady presence of participants in this process. It's been a fascinating uh, uh, webinar. Um, so um, anyone? Or if Esrat Siddiqui, if you're here, do you want to say something about what you have posted? I can't see the full screen, so. Um... Okay. Uh, Shazia, I see your hand up. Please go ahead, over to you. Yeah, I think I was just gonna take the opportunity of Philip and I just have posted the call for papers. We, we're actually having a conference in April next year at Oxford. Unfortunately, we don't have the funds to <laughs> fund anybody to come over from South Africa, but it'd be really amazing if you were in the UK. Or uh, And we could also facilitate an online presentation um, and do a hybrid uh, panel. And it's really open. So although the abstract is, um, the deadline is the 14th, if anyone's really interested, please do email me anyway. Uh, it'd be really, I think it'd be really great to get uh, some more experience from the region in general and, and have a kind of comparison. I think it's been so interesting to hear from everybody. Um, so please do take a look. We posted it in the chat um, and it'd be really fantastic if, uh, if any of you wanted to submit an abstract uh, and then we can have a discussion in April again once we've got the full report out. Yeah, thank you. Um, we do have a comment from Sepali Kotigada, a colleague from uh, Colombo. Who appreciates the sessions and the various aspects that have been covered by the speakers. Uh, also from Gita Narayanan that there is need to discuss about personal laws and how it comes into the implementation of DV law. I think Sarah has spoken to some of that point as have others. Um, Gita Sepali, do you want to come put on your video and say something? I can only see black boxes, so do come, switch on your videos. Friends, switch on your videos, let's see you all. This is good for feminist solidarity. We need to be in touch with, uh, with each other far more, and this is what better way than this. Um, okay, thank you. As usual, Sunita, you managed to get me anyway, out of my little hole to come out. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I thought actually, you know, I, I I remember the excitement and okay the effort that went into getting the domestic violence act through parliament and, and the excitement when we did and I think we have we do face the same kind of you know the we spent a couple of several years with most magistrates not being aware of it or deciding to uh, not use it. And I think that's what they do still. I think Amiza was involved in reviewing the Domestic Violence uh, Act uh, at some point for the National Committee on Women, I know. So, it, I mean, I, it looks like I think the aspects that were brought in uh, in this discussion is very, it cuts across all our countries at different levels, uh, in a sense, you know, I don't know whether that's the correct word to use, but um, so it's yeah, bringing in the legal system, legal provisions is fine. But as you know, as all of you have pointed out, there's so much more. And I think it's also the politics, the, the politics of gender and, uh, and, and patriarchy that just is so much of a uh, challenge to break through. 
So we do it. We have some success, but we are constantly uh, facing. And I, I, I mean, I really uh, also was uh, appreciated Sarah saying that you know you you all as lawyers looked at the law, but uh, didn't look at certain you know was do not did not pay so much attention to other aspects of addressing domestic violence from the social point of view and the way that you actually missed this issue on on uh, it doesn't apply to, to divorced women you know so basically it's like we have to have eyes and ears all the time everywhere uh, it's to get something through yeah that was my my uh, actually my I, thoughts when i was listening to you thank you you uh, Sapali, Gita, you want to come in? Uh, I Many thanks for the presentation and uh, it was very thought provoking. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, like I, in my, uh, you know, career, I have spent something like eight years working with domestic violence and with the short stay home. And from that experience, what I want to say is that we need to look into the class and caste dimension of domestic violence, which is very crucial, I feel. Because I'm not saying the middle class woman has all the ability to deal with the situation. Even she is powerless. She doesn't have the financial resources. All that is there. But still, the class caste dimensions play a very major role in understanding the domestic violence issue. And another thing is, in, in India, the, the, the shrinking civil society space this is the biggest ch challenge, um, you know, like uh, uh, previously, you know, like uh, they were uh, collectives who were supporting financially uh, the short stay homes, the cost of domestic violence. And with the, now the civil society is shrinking and the, the lack of funds, all that resulting into a lot of other issues. And the, the crucial issue is alcoholism. Alcoholism, you know, like um, now, you know, like... Um, See, for example, you know, like for, for in, I'm in my state, the state runs the uh, liquor uh, industry. And from the profit, the uh, welfare is taken care of. Now, this is a very big contradiction. You know, like you give free freebies to the women from the money raised by selling liquor. So, you know, alcoholism, very crucial issue when it comes to domestic violence. When we do advocacy, we have to keep on raising that issue, I feel. And another thing which I want to say is when we, I mean, long back, we used to use this term called feminist counseling. That's no more there. See, I, I, I think in 90s, we, when we went for training, you know, all these feminist capacity building, we had this something called feminist counseling. So, you know, like that is no more there. And another thing is that, you know, like, um, see in an average, look at something like Madras High Court, how long does it take for a middle class woman to get maintenance from a husband? It is something like five, six years. For a woman who's, who is a wife of an unorganized labor, there's nothing. There's nothing. The, not, the maintenance does not happen for women. It's the truth of it. And, and looking at in my own state, I feel the number of single women are growing enormously. Enormously it's growing and we need to do a lot more study, a lot more work on that area. Because I feel in all layers, the number of single women are increasing. So, you know, like, yes, the legal aid is not responding. The quality of legal aid, the lawyers the, who come from legal aid, all need to be discussed. I don't know. Sometimes I don't know. So it's as uh, one of the speakers told that, you know, whether these reforms are needed. We have this law called POSH and most of us <clears> sit in <throat> internal complaints committee and we can't even take uh, handle one case properly about uh, sexual harassment at workplace. Similarly, the, the legal reform, okay, it is there. But in what way it is helping in the implementation of, of at level level is the biggest question I have. That's all. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's very, very thought provoking. It's just a sharing. Thank you, Geeta, for raising some of these critical questions. I also have Hasna's hand up. Hasna, over to you. Can you switch on your video if you can? Hasna from Sri Lanka.
Are you there? Okay, the hand has gone down, so I'm not sure whether... Hasana, are you there? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, do you want to make an intervention, Hasana? I see your comment. No? Okay. I also have some comments from Sumbal, um, Haider from uh, Pakistan. Sumbal, do you want to say something? Chazza, I'll come to you in a bit. Hi, Sunita, can you hear me? Yes, Asana, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure whether you can see me because um, my uh, those options are not showing here suddenly. Oh. I, anyway, I'll, I'll speak. Yeah. So thank you very much for the speakers. Um, um, for me, like I also work on um, family law reform. So it was very interesting to see how uh, domestic, when it comes to domestic violence, how much of a connection it has with family laws. And uh, in South Asia, all um, um, like, you know, it can be Muslims or when it comes to Christians, minorities or Hindu majority or minorities, how in different countries uh, it affects uh, mostly women. And then um, um, there is no remedy or the lack of legal protection for women for domestic violence. And also, I would like to um, say um, the paralegal system, even in Sri Lanka, uh, for the Muslim women, uh, the court system is completely different. There is no qualification um, for the quasi judges. He should be a Muslim male. On, that is the only um, um, qualification to be a, a judge. So, and of course, how that further disadvantage women and leads into more violence. Um, and the other thing um, I would like to say is one thing is there is law which is not protect, protecting enough and the uh, other community, marginalized communities like, like LGBTIQ communities and trans and people where they live in uh, because the uh, it's criminalized in most of the countries. Um, so still they live in together but there is no protection and they, they, there is no way for them to who complain to the police station or, you know, take actions. So that point also um, um, just wanted to add that also to this discussion. Yeah, thank you. But very interesting to see, like, I totally agree with Geeta Narayanan when she said, like, we have to see the connection with these family laws and domestic violence, how it's really interconnected. Very interesting point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asna, for coming in on that point. I go to Shazia and in the meanwhile, Sumbal, if you do want to speak, just put your hand up. Shazia, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to just add that, you know, these issues are everywhere, which is we pass legislation and, um, you know, that's a huge, a huge thing. And that's really great. But then the next, but, you know, as someone said, the work doesn't stop. You have to just maintain vigilance and constant feminist vigilance as well. And this is where, um, you know, and this is where I think kind of international human rights law can play a part. I and mean, I'm just thinking about the, uh, convention that was passed in Europe, so has a so it has a really strong um, secretariat. Has Grevio. Each country has to file a report, so it's constant monitoring. And um, and I'm just wondering what part. I mean, maybe someone else can. What part the international human rights law has played in CEDAW, in particular, in relation to India? Um, you know, getting because obviously national governments have, frankly, zero interest in these issues most of the time, unless they're actually pressed to do something about it. And that's where international pressure can really help. But also, obviously, in India, you've got this vast country, as we realise, and all these uh, states have their own different ways of doing it. So the way it strikes me, the way forward is, is, is to really push um, in terms of um, getting those uh, obligations there and also within India itself. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always fascinated by India because you always hear about these every so often, these really kind of um, progressive decisions that come from the Supreme Court, but clearly are not being translated at all on the ground. And... And that's really interesting as well. So in terms of the constitutional framework as well in, in, uh, in India, you know, what's happening in relation to that in human rights and the monitoring and obligations. So it strikes me as that's, that's one way forward. Um, and, um, and yeah, this, this issue about um, civil society organisations, the shrinking, it's happening everywhere. And it's really, really disturbing uh, because that's the, that has frankly been the bedrock of any, any movement we've had in this area. It's been feminist agitation. It's been feminist organizations, grassroots organizations that are indeed responsible for CEDAW. So if they go, 
then obviously the whole system, I think, will probably collapse. So it's really, really important that we all work together in terms of lawyers, um, civil society organisations, policymakers, and just constantly uh, keep at it. But it's exhausting and it requires resources. Um, and, and that's the major issue, I think, in terms of, for me, anyway, for, I think the major issue is feminist organisations themselves um, being able to, because they're often the ones that actually, I think, get this stuff going and keep monitoring. Um, and, and that's, for me, is the most urgent thing. And I'm not sure what the answer is in relation to that. Um, but that's where we need to really focus attention. I think kind of strengthening organisations and strengthening grassroots organisations in particular. Um, and it's then it's a bottom up, it's, it's a bottom up transformation of the process. And, uh, and then we hope, therefore, that we can start um, agitating for implementation of these really, really important legal reforms. And the other thing I was going to say, just in terms of the holistic response, because I think quite a few of you have touched on that, that and that's something that we found in the research that the system just isn't very joined up. And this is, again, with something we found in, 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 in Europe, too. You know, we have like domestic, you know, and so the recent reforms have been things like one stop domestic violence courts where you have the civil, the criminal, the maintenance. It's all dealt with together. So women aren't having to sort of navigate these three different systems. And this is very new uh, in the UK, for example, and we still don't have them rolled out. So. I also just want to say, give, give yourself a break, because I mean, it's it's a, it's amazing just to achieve the reform, uh, just any legal reform. But at the end of the day, legal reforms are essentially, I think, norm setting. And then the, and then the really hard work comes afterwards, which is just making sure and agitating and, uh, and making sure that they're actually implemented uh, and legal reform as well as a process. We have to respond. But so. So, yeah, so it's really important that we carry on doing the work we're doing, um, but working together in terms of research and policy. And I think. Um, you know, projects like ours, and hopefully there's more as well, where we actually work with some society organisations as well. So it's a, you know, it's a, it, it's a process that recognises how important all those three areas really are in terms of combating violence against women. Thank you. No, there's a lot that's happening on the front uh, as far as uh, CEDA obligations and the shadow reporting by women's groups, because our state hasn't reported in time. But as you know, these are hard times and in the midst of UPR reporting, CEDAW reporting, SDG reporting, efforts are being made by feminist groups. So thank you for highlighting that. I'd like to go to Ezebir and then to Armiza, and then I'd like to take some closing comments from uh, Sara, uh, Saba, um, and then uh, we can close the webinar for the day. Ezebir, over to you. Thank you, Sonita. Uh, sorry, I cannot switch on my uh, video. I'm not feeling well. Um, okay, I just want, I, I'm sorry, I think I missed most of the webinar. It was very interesting, but my internet was not very supportive. The weather is very bad in Kashmir. Uh, but uh, whatever little I've heard, it's been really, uh, you know, uh, very interesting. And I would like to follow it up in, in the pages wherever it has been shared. I just wanted to share that, you know, as women, we also have a, a responsibility, you know, towards uh, towards other women, uh, our daughters, because generally what happens in our situations is that, you know, when our daughters are getting married, you know, we don't stop telling her that, you know, that now you're leaving this home as a bride, bride and only your dead body should leave that house. And, you know, I think this it's high time we start, start stop sharing this to our daughters, because when we are doing that, we prepare the daughter to bear and endure all and to suffer in silence. We don't empower her to say no to violence and respect her rights as a woman, but we rather, you know, force her and push her uh, towards, towards those dark areas where she's supposed to understand it that, you know, she's not in a state to share her sufferings or whatever she's going through with her family and with the other support systems. Also another point that religious clerics play a very important role in, uh, in sensitizing the situations uh, in societies, you know, and in, in case of domestic violence, I think uh, religious clerics have a very important role to play because that is where uh, all these, uh, you know, disputes eventually land because they land with the local imams of the uh, area and, and they are supposed to be taking care of the disputes and all. So I think when we are talking about sensitizing this, uh, you know, community, sensitizing people about domestic violence, domestic violence act and the rights of women and so on, I think religious clerics and imams should definitely always be taken in so that, you know, they are sensitized on these uh, issues and they play a proactive and prominent role. Um, I think, you know, 
in case, particularly in case of Kashmir, when I talk about through my experience of having worked with the women over here, that you know, when when it's only when the situation is out of hand that you know such uh, cases of domestic violence come to light. You know, there's a lot of hue and cry that is raised either when there is a suicide that is committed by that unfortunate victim or she has been killed by her in-laws because of lack of dowry or any other issue. And it's only th that time you hear a lot of people making noise, a lot of people shouting slogans and trying to create, you know, a lot of hue and cry. But what happens you all that period when that woman is suffering, why isn't that support avail avail available to her? She's left alone to suffer in silence because she knows there'll be no family support, there'll be no so support from the society because she'll always be held responsible for whatever is happening wrong in the in the marriage, you know. It's always the woman who gets to take the blame. Nobody questions the man what is wrong in the relationship. So I think it's very important that, you know, we, I know changing mindset of people is not easy, but then I think when we talk about domestic violence, it's very important to take a holistic view of the situation and also to understand uh, that it's very important that apart from the husband and wife, there are other stakeholders and people who are actively part of probably escalating that violence or also who can help to bring down the violence. Just these few words from me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now I know that we are running uh, you know, beyond that time, but just quick comments, uh, Arvisa, Sara, um, Saba, and then we'll wind up the session. Over to you, Arvisa. Thanks, Sunita. Uh, I'll just pick up on what I think was said about personal law, and also I think Hasana mentioned about Muslim personal law, in particular family law in Sri Lanka. Um, in Sri Lanka, the constitution prevents anyone, including also Muslim women, from challenging any law that has come into existence um, for being um, uh, discriminatory uh, or for being a violative of the equality provision. So we cannot challenge uh, existing laws um, for violating our rights. Uh, this is across the board. Any, any citizen is not able to challenge a law after it is enacted. We have no uh, judicial review post enactment. Uh, which I think is a serious um, uh, uh, sort of restriction of a citizen's ability to engage with the law um, and, and move it forward. Um, and it is in this context that personal law then creates an even harder, stronger barrier shell um, that Muslim women, particularly in Sri Lanka, cannot overcome. So then issues like child marriage, issues like uh, the impact of polygamous relationships and the abuse of those uh, of that practice, uh, the fact that only um, adjudicators, only Qazis uh, that adjudicate on Muslim family law issues are only men who are, have no, there is no requirement of any training like Hassan mentioned. Um, and all these deep injustices, these, these practices that actually are violence in, in very many ways on the lives of Muslim women and uh, children cannot be addressed because of constitutional barriers to do so. And, and I think this, this broader context in which these laws operate really needs to be, I mean, also considered. And we, we understand our job as also not um, challenge in the laws in particular, but also having these constitutional debates and having to challenge constitutions, uh, having to challenge the broader political, um, violent political structures as well uh, in, in our advocacy work. Um, something that um, I know everyone's been talking about the enormity of the, uh, the challenges, but uh, uh, it, I think really kudos to everyone who's working on this because it's impossible work sometimes and it takes a toll. Um, uh, and I think I really just want to bring that appreciation to the table as we close, because I also don't know and I and where we find uh, the inspiration. I, I'm finding it right here, being in the presence of everyone and hearing all these stories, um, but really to keep moving on in this work, um, we really need to build those solidarities, certainly. Thank you. Very well said, Amisa, very well said. Over to you, Sarah, any closing comments? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, 
just Amisa to say uh, it is terrible about Sri Lanka not being able to challenge legislation, but of course you can challenge bills, um, which is an interesting thing that the rest of us can't do in the region, and you've had some successes on that. So I think this, you know, the South Asian space is really important for us because there are so many uh, very similar opportunities that we're not taking, but we could when we learn about them from each other. But the area I'd really like to learn more about, I think, is also procedural changes. And I think also this multidisciplinary approach, I would really like to learn more about what's being done, for example, on strengthening the safety net system. Um, what's being, uh, Dastak has always been a huge example to all of us in terms of a really extraordinary example of a well-run feminist shelter. Uh, we don't have that many of them in the region. So I think like looking at what, what are some of these things are, these innovations that we've made, which are not innovations now, they've been around for a long time, but there's a whole new generation in a way that needs to kind of learn about these from each other. And we need to kind of see how we fit them into our working practices. So I'd be really interested in continuing this conversation, taking the focus out from the legal framework and looking, I think in the way that Philippa, uh, that your researchers and, and Strazia, that your research has shown us that we want to be looking at application challenges. And we want to be looking at the kinds of interventions to respond to those. And I think I think we could learn a lot from that. And I'd like to sort of add to that, that I think the other group we could bring in since we're doing this regional and Zoom enabled conversation, it'd be very interesting to look at South Asian feminist groups working outside South Asia, because they've also had some amazing, you know, working in minority contexts. Um, I think they have some very important lessons for us where we also work with these large majorities and, you know, very challenged minorities in each of our different country contexts. If you could bring in groups like, you know, South All Black Sisters from the UK, Saki from the US and so on, I think that would also give us another dimension to our conversation. But thanks so much again for organizing this. Yeah. Thank you. Good way to move forward. Um, Saba, your closing comments. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was lovely to hear everybody in their sort of perspectives. Um, I think it's really important to have these sort of cross-regional conversations. I think we need to learn a great deal from each other. Um, but I think one thing I just want to stress on is, especially since everybody's pointed out that, you know, the civil society space is shrinking in each of the countries. I think it's really, it's time for that kind of solidarity, everybody to come together across South Asia also, because there's so much that we have in common. Uh, we're all struggling with the domestic violence laws in our countries. And I think they, with, given the sort of similar social sort of um, fabric that we share and similar values, I think we can, if we sort of come together, we can really push for sort of change, um, you know, for women uh, across South Asia and I think so um, and also within Pakistan we, I also feel we need more solidarity because now we have limited resources and instead of like duplicity of efforts where, where multiple organizations are doing the same kind of work I think it's also time for people to sort of club resources and come together so that we're able to do more effective work than just repeating or just reinventing the wheel but again thank you very much for inviting me it was great being on this panel thank you thank you Thank you, everybody. What a stellar panel and such good interventions from the floor. Thank you, uh, Rajanya, for putting us all together. And I agree with Sarah and many of the others. I think this conversation is still incomplete. There's a lot we need to learn. There's a lot we need to bring, um, uh, you know, to give visibility to our practices, our challenges, and to share with each other. And I hope there's part two. At some point, we can do it. In fact, you know what I was thinking about since we're talking about feminist uh, practices, feminist vigilance, feminist uh, solidarities, also about feminist resourcing. The UN Trust Fund has put out a call. And if this group is interested in putting a joint proposal together on some of the issues that you have highlighted, it would be wonderful. Because I think amongst the points that have been highlighted is the need to be able to look at data, to be able to look at evidence, to hear the stories, to look at what we're doing in between the cracks between the law and, and the implementation, and also the focus on survivors and how they are transforming their lives and, and also pushing the system to reform. Uh, so I was just thinking maybe that's something that uh, I don't know how all of us work on feminist times, which is non-resourced and work on our commitment to the larger cause. But that's something perhaps, uh, Rajania, since you have put this together, uh, you may want to think about a regional proposal. It's it's not foreign funds when it 